Hey guys. Yes, yeah, so um, 2004, I was a youth pastor in Texas while I was at Dallas Seminary working on my master's down there. And then 2005, came to the valley and uh, met Joe that year, 2005. And uh, it's a long time ago now, but uh, the youth pastors would get together once a month and uh, or maybe something like that. And uh, I just, I remember seeing in Joe um, somebody who was very positive and um, enthusiastic, loved the Lord, and uh, encouraging. Like, he was really encouraging. Like, what's going on? How's your ministry? What's going on in your life? And so, a couple years later, I came in 2005. I'm from York, Pennsylvania. Uh, 2007, I started dreaming about church planting. That summer, I attended a conference and some things. And um, yeah, that fall. And then, and then spring of 2008, I guess January, February, I can't remember exactly when, Joe and I started dreaming together. So it wasn't just kind of me and some of my friends, but then had Joe, and yeah, and he was having a bit of a tough time, and, and but I knew, like, I, I remember that in Joe, there's this, there's this, um, you guys know, you ever, most of you all know Joe, right? Like, there's, there's, a, there's a heart, and there's a concern, and there's a care, and I thought, that, that's a guy who could, who could really do something really special, and I'd love to work with. So, um, you know, there's a small team of us, and we started dreaming of what to call this thing, and uh, what we would be, and um, yeah, it was an exciting time. I will say, um, I haven't preached in 10 years, so I am a little nervous. I'll start with a little story here just to, to get myself calmed down a little bit. But um, I, uh, I, was, I was part of every, all of this and getting us going, and up, I left my church in 2008 and was all in on this. I worked nights at a hospital for a year uh, just to get us going and put the time in, into this, and it was an exciting time. Um, I will say that... Um, one of the values that we had in those early days was that, you know, God, um, through Christ, changes believers' hearts that they actually desire to do his will. That there's the inclination, your natural inclination is to do what's right rather than to do what's wrong. And, but, but we need to do that in partnership. We do that in, in harmony with other believers. That, that was part of that, that theme. So when, you know, I, I just a little, come back a little bit. 2009, I... Um, started feeling called toward doing other things, uh, academic things, and I moved to China. And I was in Tianjin, China for three years, and then uh, I've been in Taiwan, Taipei, for the last 10 years, I guess, um, studying. I'm, I'm finishing up a master's degree now, and I've been um, teaching English, so I do a little bit of teaching, <laughs> but not much. So when Joe asked me, I was, I was, I was, I mean, I'm kind of nervous. I haven't taught, I mean, I haven't preached in 10 years. I'm an ordained pastor, and I haven't taught in 10 years. And, uh, uh, and so I said, I need to think about that and pray about it a little bit. And I waited a couple weeks. And, you, you know, I came back to those original values that we had when Riverbend was starting of, you know, this is a, a partnership. You know, it's, it's people whose hearts have been changed mostly, right, or those who are in the process. And it's us working together to support each other and help each other to, to do what God's calling us to do. And I thought, well, I can do that, right? So I don't know how we'll do this morning. Uh, I'll do my best. Uh, I'm a little bit nervous, but uh, yeah, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. And I'm I'm super thrilled that, that Joe invited me. It's uh, uh, it's pretty exciting, and it was it was cool to be it was cool to be here a long time ago, uh, and to be here now is super cool too. So I tell you, what we're gonna do this morning. I'm trying to do something new I've never done before. Um, but the passage that they've asked me to talk about, um, I just split it into four parts. And so what I w- would like to do is we're gonna put it on the screen, and this is the first part. Okay. What I'd like us to do, I want us to try to see if we can all read it aloud together. I don't know if that's possible, Uh, but we'll give it a try, okay? All right, so this is the first one today. Let's try to read it together. Uh, We'll read the the John 16, 16 to 33 part first. Okay, let's try to read it together. John 16, 16 to 33. Jesus went on to say, in a little while, you will see me no more. And then after a little while, you will see me. At this... Some of his disciples said to one another, What does he mean by saying, In a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me, and because I'm going to the Father? They kept asking, What does he mean by a little while? We don't understand what he's saying. Jesus saw that they wanted to ask him about this, so he said to them, Are you asking one another, What I mean when I said, in a little while you will see me no more, and then after a little while you will see me. Um, This is a kind of a dark time 
in the history of, uh, well, in the Bible, but a dark time in the history of the church. You know, not long before this, we had the Last Supper. And just that word last, right? Last Supper kind of already tells you, like, these, these disciples had sacrificed everything, right, for a cause. They, they, they met Jesus one way or another, and they'd sacrificed it all, put it all on the line. All their eggs are in this one basket, and they're following Christ. And he's, you know, you guys have been studying this, this passage. You know, he's, he said, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be leaving. And it's, you're, you're going to be what? <laughs> you know, because the, like they, they, they'd given everything for this. They thought the kingdom was going to come in. And there's this time of grief. The, the Bible uses that, that phrase several times. It's the Last Supper, and now it's the upper room discourse where he's saying, hey, I'm going to be leaving, guys. I'm, I'm going to give you the spirit, but I'm going to be leaving. And you can just, I mean, I don't know if you can put yourself in those shoes, but it's like it's the, the end of something, right? It's not the beginning of something to them. It's the end of something. And so... At this point here, John 16, 16 to 33, he's, he, Jesus has been speaking for two chapters. I, don't know if you've, I guess you've been going piece by piece through this. Nobody's interrupted Jesus for, for two chapters. All right? He's just been talking, and they've been listening. And this is the first time that there's an interruption. Uh, but it's a little bit of an uh, interesting interruption. Uh, and if you want to see what kind of spurs the interruption, it's this phrase, little while. Look, look how many times you get in a little while here, right? It's, wait, you mean now? Like, you get that sense of like the, the, the train's about to crash into something, right? It's that, what, oh, you, you mean now? Like, it's going to happen now. Um, the, the Greek here is the word micron, which is the same as micro. Like, it's, it's going to be real short. Something's about to go down. And the disciples, I think, are waking up to the, the wow, this is really happening. This is, this is really going to happen. Um, and I think it's really interesting in this passage is, if you look down here, it says, they kept asking. Do you see that here? He, he said, uh, at this, some of his disciples said to one another. They're not talking to Jesus. They're talking to one another. I, I don't know what you picture. I mean, I guess it's the upper room discourse. Jesus is talking to them. And now they're chatting with each other. I, I kind of picture like a bathroom break, maybe. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know, but like they're not talking to Jesus, right? So maybe it's like uh, the modern day version of get your coffee and your, your piece of cake or whatever at the upper room discourse. I don't know, but they're chatting with one another. Saying to one another, what, what is... What, is, what does he mean? So again, they're not like, not what do you mean? He's right, probably not, not far away. But they're talking to each other. Like, what, what, is, what does he mean? And they kept asking. So it seems like it's a, a conversation, right? And this is the first time you see them talking. I, uh, I get this. I, so I live in Taiwan. And uh, to support myself, I teach English. Uh, I teach students who want to go to uh, America or Europe, Australia, to, to study in university. They have to pass these English language tests. And I know Chinese. And sometimes when I'm teaching them, I teach group classes and one-on-one, but also group classes. I'll, I'll hear them start chatting amongst themselves, and it's exactly like this: like, what, what, what does he mean, right? Fortunately, I know Chinese, and sometimes I'm able to get in. No, 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 no that's not what I mean. This is this is what I mean. And you kind of get that sense here of the disciples, like they're, they're a little confused, right? They're trying to figure out what's going on. Wait, what does what what is what does he mean? What's this all this this in a little while stuff? And they're they're chatting, they're asking each other what's going on. And, oh, hold on, let me find out where I am here. Okay. Uh, and I, even though they don't understand, they know that something's big is coming because of this, this no more here stuff. Jesus wants to say, in a little while you will see me no more. This, this is a little bit confusing, actually, and it's part of the reason there's some confusion. That idea of no more would be like, not again, like not ever again. In a little while you'll never see me again. And then he says, and then after a little while you'll see me. Right? So it's no wonder they're a little bit confused. Like, what, wait, wait, what do you mean? And, and it'll always seem no more, and, and because I'm going to the Father. That actually is said previously. You guys have, have learned that here before. And it's that, it's that sense that, like, we don't quite know what you're talking about, but we're pretty sure things are going to change. Uh, I, I, I mean, I think we all have this, this in our life where sometimes something changes, and you know that it's changed. Like, I mean, it could be the death of a loved one, the, the loss of a job, uh, moving away from friends and family, and it's like, wow, that was that that part of my life is over now. That's 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 gone. Um, I, I come back to 2009 uh, here at Riverbend. I was, you know, I, I I was with Joe. We threw our hearts into into getting getting things going with with others of you who are who are here today and some who are not. And at some point, uh, 
yeah, th- things just change, right? And for Riverbend, I mean, they were, I, you guys were in great hands, right? Uh, th- there, was a, there was a good team, but like, I, I just kind of stepped into nothing, right, in China. And I think, uh, you know, I, trying to be everybody's partner here this morning, if that's what I'm trying to do, if you can put yourself in these guys' shoes and see how Jesus responds to them, I think it'll help you. Because uh, that's what I tried to do as I was looking at this and just remembering for me what that was like of like, wow, this is the, the end of something, right? Something, something is coming to an end and this is scary. Jesus had guided them. He had led them. And then he's saying goodbye, right? And, and there's something scary about that. And, and uh, you know, I've, I've said goodbye to loved ones and things are, Things are never the same. I've started on new, new things and left old things behind and things are never the same. And there's that, I don't know, grief is a word that comes up a lot here, but there's just a, a sense of loss, I think, in that. And they're confused and they don't know what's going on. And you can picture that for them. You can picture that. There they are in an upper room and nothing's ever going to be the same. They don't understand what's going to happen, but nothing's ever going to be the same again. Something's really encouraging in this passage, though, because if you look down here, Jesus saw that they wanted to ask them about this. So Jesus is not indifferent to this. These guys are pretty nervous. They put everything on the line for this cause, for this person, this, this, this wonderful man who could, you know, make bread for people and calm the seas and, and all this. They put everything on the line for him. Now he says, I'm going to go and you guys are going to be here. Good luck. Not in that term, don't get me wrong. But, but that's, that must be kind of how it felt at that point, right? And Jesus is not insensitive to that. Jesus, Jesus gets it. He sees how they're feeling and he says you know he saw they wanted to ask him about it and so he asked them "Uh, um are you asking one another right you see jesus here can are you okay can i help you here are you asking one another what i meant when i said in a little while you'll see me no more and after a little while you'll see me and i think that's good for us to remember that in the midst of our difficult times and times of change that jesus is not indifferent he is aware of what's going on Yeah, that when you're suffering, you're not suffering alone. When you're hurting, you're not hurting alone. If you're not a believer, this, it's available to you as well. That you don't have to live in your own pain. You don't have to hurt in your own pain. There is somebody who is, you know, who, who is concerned about you. So Jesus responds. I, I kind of think they might, they might wish they hadn't asked him, actually, though. Uh, when you look at his response here, uh, let's, let's read this one together. Very truly, I tell you, you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. A woman giving birth to a child has pain because her time has come. The child is born into the world. So with you. Your time of grief. But I will see you again. No one will take away your joy. I I don't know if there's a darker passage in the scripture. I highlighted the, I highlighted some words here. Look at this passage. (laughs) Weep, mourn, grieve, grief, pain, anguish, grief. I mean, maybe, maybe there's something worse than that, but if you can find a passage of the Bible that's that short and has that many, like, painful words, it's like, thanks for giving me this passage, Joe. <laughs> Give the grief, pain, anguish uh, sermon this morning. But that's, that's, a, that's a pretty rough passage right there. And um, I want you to uh, just notice there's two contrasts here in this passage. And I think, like, I, I don't think I'm somebody who's really good at... Um, emotional stuff to be honest um i'm kind of a head guy and i don't think i'm always like like one of the reasons i was so happy to work with joe is i knew that he's a heart guy like he he gets your heart he knows what's going on and i'm more i'm more of a head guy so I, this passage has been a little challenging for me but when you look here you'll see that there are two contrasts in this passage one is that you will weep and mourn while the world rejoices that's one and the other is you will grieve but your grief will turn to joy so there's there's two interesting contrasts here there's one like this is how it is for you in your little dark world while all the happy people are over here, right? And I think most of us can relate to that. And the other one is, this is your little dark world compared to how your happy world's going to be in the future. You yourself, this will get better. Think things will get better. 
And there's, a, there's an interesting contrast here because I think most of us can probably relate to both of those. That's one of the cool things about the Bible. I, I, the Bible gets it. Like the Bible gets life. They know how life is and they get it. I, I mean, I don't know how, how often you guys are in the Bible, how much you read the Bible, but the more you read it, the more you realize, well, this is real. Like this is real, real people, real stuff. Uh, when I was in seminary, they said something like, um, the Bible is such a book that no one would write it if they could or could write it if they would. It's, 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 it's almost an impossible book to write. And there's so many things about it that are like, oh, this is, well, this is really real. Like they really, they really get me here. I, I, I imagine some of you, maybe right now, have that, that like you're in the, a dark period perhaps. Something's just, uh, you, it's in your mind. It wakes you up. You're thinking about it. You don't know what to do about it. Um, it could be, you know, financial, family, conflict. I think th- those are the things that we've got. Uh, some of you guys remember even, you know, in your school days perhaps, kind of you have the darkness while everybody else is, is happy, right? And that's, that's, I mean, this is a future. This is a prediction. This is what's going to happen to you, all right? You're going to be miserable while they're happy. In some, way, in some ways, you have to think the disciples are probably like, why, like, why us? Like, Jesus could have come 100 years earlier, <laughs> could have come 100 years later, right? Why am I stuck in the middle of this thing? Why am I the guy who got to love this, this man who walks on water and does all of these things? Why, why, is, you know, why do I have to be the one that has to have him depart? Why am I going to be the one that's grieving? Yeah, and that why me kind of thing, I think, is a, yeah, a common part of this. And the other thing is, while the world rejoices, you, the world's come up in this passage previously in the upper, course, upper room discourse, but who, who's this world that's rejoicing? They're the ones who are saying, Barabbas, free Barabbas, free Barabbas, right? It's, it's those who were against Christ, right? That's who it is. They're the ones who, I mean, who else is rejoicing that, that Christ has died, right? That's what this is talking about. Who else is rejoicing in that? It's all those who were against Christ, Right? And you're going to be mourning while they're all out there rejoicing. And then the other one here is yourself. You will grieve, but your grief will turn to joy. So that's the second contrast here. And I think a lot of you can probably relate to that as well, right? I mean, I hope you can. I remember when I was in high school, I had a friend who uh, was thinking about committing suicide. And I spent so many hours on the phone with her, talking and encouraging her that you don't know what's going to happen next. You don't know... Things could be so much better tomorrow and you're, you're going to miss what's, what could have happened in your life. Things could get so much better for you. And I, I see that in this passage here that, okay, it's hard now. You're in a dark place now. It's dark here now. But take hope. Take hope. It doesn't stay dark forever. It doesn't stay dark forever. You're going to grieve, but not forever. There's brightness down the road for you. And I, I love that contrast. I think it's a, it's a really, really sweet contrast. Um, in, uh, in Taiwan, I study Chinese philosophy. And uh, um, I study, I've been studying this guy named Sung Zhao, who's a philosopher but from like 300 AD. His, his deal is that like every, everything exists only for one moment and then it's gone forever. And so that like the, the shad of right now is not the shad that you saw five minutes ago. It's a different shad. That's, that's his deal. But it, 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 sometimes like, it, it gets me thinking, like, you know what? The, the things that I'm doing right now are affecting the shadow of tomorrow, right? The, 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 the things, whether, wait, you don't have to believe what some job believes. Uh, he, he believes you're, that's a totally different person. It's cause and effect, and you're affecting that person. But even, even as a believer, you can certainly believe that the, the things that you're dealing with now, the things that you're struggling with now are affecting a future you. And man, I just, I hope that in this, in this current time that you're, you're investing in your future self and hang in there, hang in there in a dark time. Um, things are hard sometimes, I know. Um, and, and, but, but things get better. Things get better. Uh, a couple of things here before we go on. Um, this real quick, this part here about a woman, a woman gives birth to a child, she has pain. When the baby is born, she forgets the anguish. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> I mean, I'm a dude, so I don't really know. Uh, I, I, I guess maybe, maybe it's comparative. I'm not sure it's gone forever, yeah. But I guess it's comparative. But one thing that's interesting in this passage here too is he says your grief's going to turn to joy. She forgets the anguish because of her joy. So with you, now's your time of grief. Okay, here's your dark place. But I'll see you again and you'll rejoice and no one will take away your 
joy. And we have, I think that it's a logical question to ask, when is he talking about here? I will see you again, and you will rejoice. Okay, that's easy, right? We know what's going to happen. We know the story. They don't know it, but we know the story. Christ is going to die on the cross. He's going to be gone for three days. He's going to come back, right? You'll see me again. You're going to rejoice. And no one will take away your joy. But if you think about what happens next, Jesus is only around for about 40 days, right? And then he's gone. And, and what happens next? Do, we know the, do you know what happens next? It gets pretty bad, right? It gets pretty rough for these guys. So it's not like this is like the heavenly joy forever and ever joy. They get 40 days with Jesus and he's gone and then there's a lot of persecution. So what does he mean no one's going to take away your joy? This is interesting to me. This is an interesting passage. That you're going to keep joy despite all the junk that you're going to deal with. There's going to be joy despite all the junk. You're going to be persecuted. It's going to get rough. But that there's a, a joy in the midst of that, which is, sh- is really encouraging. Like, I mean, to put yourself in their shoes, but also in, in our shoes as we, where we are, we, I mean, a lot of us deal with junk. And that, that, that there can be joy in the midst of that is super cool. Some of it you see in the next passage here. Let's read the next passage together. In that day, you will no longer ask me anything. Very truly, I tell you, my Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. Until now, you have not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you will receive, and your joy will be complete. Though I've been speaking figuratively, a time is coming when I will no longer use this kind of language, but will tell you plainly about my Father. In that day, you will ask in my name. I'm not saying that I will ask the Father on your behalf, No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Um, Just as a small note, in the Greek there, that first ask means like to ask a question. The rest of these are all about requesting. But forget about that. Isn't isn't this one of the most beautiful passages you've ever seen? Just when I looked at this passage, I thought, man, what a special passage. I mean, you don't have to look at me. Look at the screens. Or look at your Bible. It's, I mean, it's, a, it's just an amazing, amazing passage. Look, look down, like, starting at verse 26. In that day you'll ask in my name. I'm not saying I'll ask the Father on your behalf. No, the Father himself loves you because you have loved me and have believed that I came from God. Verse 24, until now you've not asked for anything in my name. Ask and you'll receive and your joy will be complete. What a, what a pretty passage. It reminds me of the early days of Riverbend when we, were, when we were dreaming. We had a few principles early on when we were getting started. Um, uh, I had read the, bo- the book Simple Church and uh, there was a, a desire to be simple and just do things as, as simply as we could. We didn't want to get overly complex. Like keep it simple. The idea of partnering with God's people. Um, Joe had a, a, a real desire to see Jesus preached. One of, the, one of the ideas that was there, though, was that idea that for a believer, when you trust Christ, th- I mean, things change. Your heart changes. He writes his word on your heart, and he guides you in his way. And that you just need partners to help you to do that. You just need partners to help you get through doing what it is that you're supposed to do during your 70 or 80 years till you're gone, right? And I, I just love this, pa- this passage here. This idea that, okay, you don't, you, don't, you don't have to go through me. I mean, you have to go through Jesus, but you don't have to, like, you have to ask me and then I'll ask the, ask the father. Kind of like, hey, can you ask your dad if we can? It's like, no, 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 no. You ask my dad. My dad loves you. And there's just something super cool about this passage. I think it's one of those beautiful passages that I've seen lately that, no, no you don't need to ask. Just the, of course the Father loves you. And why wouldn't you ask him? He, he loves you. Some of you have kids. A lot of you have kids. I mean, of course, when, you, when your kids ask for things, you don't just give them what they want. Right? 
but you, you give them what they should have, right? If your kid needs something or should have something, of course you give that. And you've got God here saying, hey, look, or not God, Jesus here saying, you know, hey, look, you, you don't have to ask me to ask him. You ask him. He, he cares about you. He loves you. He wants to give you what you need. I mean, I don't know. We all have different lives. We have different things going on in our lives. I'm, heck, I live in Asia. I don't know what's going on in America half the time. But I know that there's junk. There must be, right? And, and, and to know that, you, no, you don't, you don't need to go to somebody that God loves you. Ask him, what would you have me do? Could you please guide me? Could you please tell me? Um, super cool. I, it's, I think it's one of the coolest passages. I don't have anything else to say about this one. We can go to the next one. I just, I, I love that passage. I think it's a very cool passage. All right, last one, okay? I said there's four. Here's the last one. Here we go. Let's read it together. I came from the Father and entered the world. Now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. Then Jesus' disciples said, Now you're speaking clearly and without figures of speech. Now we can see that you know all things and that you do not even need to have anyone ask you questions. This makes us believe that you came from God. Do you believe? Oh, do you now, sorry. That's a good end. Do you now believe? Jesus replied, A time is coming, and in fact has come, when you will be scattered, each to your own home. You will leave me all alone. I think we've got more, right? Yeah. Yet I am not alone, for my Father is with me. I've told you these things, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you'll have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. All right. Uh, there's, there's a couple things that are kind of funny about this passage. Can, can you go here? <laughs> this, this, something's interesting here. Um, all that Jesus says is, I came from the Father, entered the world, now I'm leaving the world and going back to the Father. And Jesus' disciples are like, wow, you spoke straightforward, no figures of speech. Like, there's, there's this, this almost funny amazement. Uh, you're speaking clearly. The, the other thing that's funny about this passage is, now we can see that you know all things and that you don't have to ask anyone questions. Doesn't that seem like the opposite? It should be, we can see that you know all things so you don't have to ask other people questions. But they said we can see that you know all things so people don't need to ask you questions. It's kind of, a little bit, seems a little reversed, right? And I think the idea here is, you know, in the past Jesus had spoken in this figurative language and finally, speaking clearly and said, we don't have to ask, what does that mean? What does this mean? We can't get quite what you're saying. He said, no, we know that you know all things, and you're now you're speaking our language. We, we, we get what you're saying. And then I think there's one of the uh, like, f um, ironic, funny passages here. It's kind of this understated. Look what the disciples say. This makes us believe that you came from God. Wait, you've seen all of these miracles right? You've seen all of this amazing stuff. The blind are seeing, the lame are walking. You've seen all of this, and they said, oh, you said that clearly. Now we believe. I, it's, I think it's one of the most, like, I, it, it's kind of like, if there's any humor in the Bible, well, there is, but here's, here's one of the places for it, I think, that, that that's what they say. And you almost want to read sarcasm in Jesus' voice here, don't you? You almost read, oh, now you believe, do you? Um, I, I don't think that's what it is, though. I think it's more like a confession of faith, right? You know, those of you who have come from maybe a confessional background where every week we believe in God, the Father, the... I think it's, oh, okay, so do you now believe? He's asking for their confession. That, that's how I read this. Uh, do you now believe, Jesus said? And things have been pretty good in this sermon, uh, not from my preaching, but in the, in the sermon, they've been pretty positive, and then they turn dark again, okay? So we'll go dark a little bit here again. He says, hey, look, do you now believe... In a little while, in a little while, in a little while, we're back to that again. A time is coming, and you're going to be scattered, each to your own home, and you're going to leave. And if you can put yourself in the shoes of the disciples, I mean, it's, it's a scary time, right? This is a scary time for them. They're facing stuff they never anticipated, and it's scary. And the darkness comes back. And then our final slide here, I think. Um, oh, I want to focus on this just real quick. I'm sorry, I don't want to go long, but we're, we're getting there. Um, 
if we can just focus our attention on Jesus for a second and how Jesus is going to feel over these next how many hours? Not only is he going to be on a cross and persecuted, but he's going to be abandoned. If you can think about Jesus as a, you know, as God, but also as a man, and how that must feel to know that, I mean, of course the disciples are going to have a really rough time, but he's, he's got a really, really rough time coming. Right? And if you can put yourself in his shoes, he, he, he knows what's about to happen. He's about to be abandoned. And then to the last slide here, uh, Jesus said, but I'm not alone. The Father is with me. I've told you these things so that in me you may have peace. Remember, you don't have to say, could you ask your dad about... God says, look, my dad loves you. Ask him. He loves you. What about the joy? Isn't the joy going to go away whenever the persecution starts? Look, you can have joy in that. You belong to the Father. He loves you. He's going to take care of you. Even in the midst of that, even in the midst of whatever you are dealing with, there is peace available. Not some manufactured peace, peace of belonging. The peace of belonging to somebody who loves you. I mean, you might feel rejected by the church even, feel rejected by the church, your friends, whatever, I don't know. But you still belong to somebody who loves you. I do. I belong to somebody who loves me even in the midst of whatever is going on. In this world, you'll have trouble. Take heart, though. I've overcome the world. Sometimes we kind of praise these great Christian leaders and things because they are good at this or good at that or whatever. I really think the, the, the successful Christian, the good Christian, is the one who can, who can do this, who can take heart. That when things get bad, they can just, I, I just need to refocus. I just, I just need to come back to what, how the Spirit's leading me and talk to the Father, and I can get through it. And I think, in my mind, the Christians who are able to do that for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years, I think th those are the real heroes. Those are the real heroes. And uh, not that we want to be a hero, but I think that's the way the Christian life is meant to be lived. There's going to be bad stuff, and we... We keep coming back to the Father, knowing he loves us, and we belong. Let's pray. Um, Father, it's, um, man, super cool uh, that I can even be here this morning. Um, and uh, and I, I mean, to partner with your, your believers, many of them here who believe you, and to be able to get to partner with them and encourage them a little bit is, man, what an honor. And, and I pray that we all, as we face the things that life throws at us, and as we are in these dark places while others are in light places, even in the midst of that, we'd find joy and find peace. You're the Prince of Peace, you, you, and you care about us. We don't have to ask somebody to ask their father. You care about us. You, you love us. And just thank you for that. Uh, help us to encourage one another. Uh, everybody's got junk in their life. And help us to encourage one another, be patient with one another. And, uh, yeah, to be you, uh, to, to exemplify you in our lives, in our relationships with others. Pray this in your name. Amen.